Welcome to our third Reimagined in America webinar. I'm Karobi Acharya, and I lead the Global Ideas for U.S. Solutions team at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. On today's webinar, you'll hear from our two speakers, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Everyone's audio has been muted, but you'll be able to ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And before we begin, I want to let you know that we are recording the webinar and we'll be sharing the recording with you afterwards. So a couple of years ago, I had the good fortune to visit Copenhagen with our speakers. And when I was there, I saw kids jumping into the harbor to swim. What struck me is that this harbor used to be toxic, just like many of our rivers here. Across the US, many people can't imagine jumping into the rivers and harbors in their own communities. But seeing these kids in Copenhagen opened up my mind to what's possible in the US. Sometimes we have to leave our country, literally or figuratively, to see that the way we do things here is not the way we have to do them. So that's exactly what we're doing at RWJF. As we work alongside others to build a culture of health, we're looking abroad for good ideas that we can bring back home to help everyone in America live a healthy, fulfilling life. We know we need to improve the places where we live, learn, work, and play, the places where health happens. We wanted to better understand how to shape public spaces so that they are welcoming to all and contribute to everyone's well-being. And so we wondered, how do other countries do it? So we embarked on a journey to find out, and we're excited to share what we're learning with you today. Before we dive into the discussion, here's a short video to give you a quick look into how public spaces around the world are helping to improve health and well-being. How do we know that a city is built for people and that all people feel welcome there. Ten years ago, this was all asphalt. Now, after being restored to its intended use, Shinley Plaza is a gathering place, a public space where everyone feels welcome. But a welcoming public space doesn't happen by chance, and it's not about one single space. Parks, plazas, and squares, and the bridges, bike paths, sidewalks, and street corners connecting them all need to be shaped intentionally and collaboratively. They come together so that people feel respected, safe, and accommodated, regardless of who they are, where they come from, or how old they are. They invite people to linger. Learn more at inclusivehealthyplaces.org. Be sure to check out the longer version of this video. You'll get the link after the webinar. So now we wanna do a quick poll to learn a little bit about all of you. You'll see a prompt on your screen with two questions. Just click on your answers. So the first question, why did you join today's webinar? Check all that apply. And the second question is how can we best ensure our public spaces are welcoming to all? And choose one and just note that there are actually four responses to the second question and some of you may need to scroll down to see all four uh, answer choices. Okay, last chance to vote. Just giving people another second or two. Okay, let's see the results. So it's really interesting. Um, it looks like it, uh, many people have, have, uh, have different reasons for choosing today's webinar. Some want to be inspired by other countries. Uh, 
some public spaces and some looking for, for ideas for your own community, which is great. Um, and in terms of ensuring our public spaces are welcoming to all, it looks like the majority of people, 56%, really are focused on engaging all voices in the planning process, which, which is great. That's a, a big part of what we'll be talking about today. And now I'm delighted to introduce to you our guest speakers. So Shinpei Tsai is the director of the Gale Institute. Working with RWJS, Gale developed the Inclusive Healthy Places Framework to help guide city planners, architects, policymakers, and community leaders to cultivate inclusion and health into public space projects. The framework is informed by best practices observed in cities around the world. Stephanie Gidibe is Director and Senior Advisor for Urban Solutions at the Natural Resource Defense Council. Stephanie leads SPARC, a $90 million investment in equitable infrastructure. SPARC stands for the Strong, Prosperous, and Resilient Communities Challenge. I'd like to kick things off by asking Shinpei and Stephanie a couple of questions, and then I'll turn it over to you, our audience, to ask questions yourself. So feel free to add questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So let's get started. Shinpei, you organized a study tour to Copenhagen and Malmo to learn about how other countries use their public spaces. Why did you choose those two places? It's such a good question, and it's not to say that those are um, the you know model places per se, but there were two cities that had incorporated um, social sustainability or policies around inclusion in their public spaces as part of the planning process. Um, there's a mandate to have those kinds of metrics in the system, and there were tons of ex beautiful examples, inspirational examples around the city that we could actually point to and look at and learn from. Um, so it was great to be able to look at, um, there, you know, there are two cities that are very close to each other but have slightly different uh, cultures and governance structures and to be able to compare and think about what we could bring back to the US from those places. Thanks, and, and Stephanie, you were with Gail on the study tour. What was your biggest takeaway on what the U.S. could learn from places like that? Yes, it was truly a great opportunity and just being able to understand what was happening. And I think uh, three things that really come to me is just the importance of investment in the built environment and social programs. In Copenhagen, one of the things that we were able to really understand is the importance of targeted planning, capital, and social service support as areas of opportunities that they they coordinate together. The government has created an umbrella of policies at all levels of governance, and everything from the schools to the sidewalks are improved through robust community input, which was incredible in hearing, in addition to how they develop neighborhoods in a holistic way. Similarly, the cities of in, in the United States are doing um, work comparatively um, that really shifts from to a people-centered planning um, and being able to address the social determinants of health. I think the second piece that was very um, interesting was that they built on their, commu their existing community assets and the ways in which they were thinking about where they invested. And Copenhagen leaders built on um, plans that neighborhoods had already developed on and and they were able to really think about how they funded those projects in advance. Um, so I think one of the key points is just avoiding a one size fits all approach. And it was clear that they really thought about the neighborhoods that they were targeting. And then the final piece was that they actually addressed the immediate needs. Um, in a lot of our communities today, we often plan for who's coming, not necessarily who's here now and living in those neighborhoods. And it was really powerful to see the conscious investment that was made to address what residents were looking for and trying to incorporate in the regional values. That's great. Thanks. Shinpei, coming out of this learning journey, you developed the Inclusive Healthy Places Framework. Uh, tell us a little bit about it and what's your main and what the main takeaway is from that work. Yeah, it was such a privilege to be able to um, take a look at take a look 
at the um, ways that people, you know, the entire process by which places are shaped to look at these other places such as Copenhagen, Malmo, and then even, you know, other places throughout the world and think about ways that they were um, striving for inclusion and, and to create a framework. And so it's a, it's the framework is a bridge between public health and public spaces. It shows the role that the very important role that public spaces has in supporting public health, particularly around the um, areas of inclusion. And I think, uh, you know, the work is really, it was a very iterative process. It, it involved interviews and um, beyond the literature review and study tours and, and sort of hands-on application with uh, people, you know, looking at things together and considering the um, kind of draft frameworks or ways of seeing, setting up principles for this framework along the way. And what we ended up with after doing all of that learning together, in addition to some analysis around, you know, existing frameworks, um, was to create a living document, something that could be improved on, hopefully, uh, that has four basic principles. I think what really sets this framework apart from other frameworks is that um, only one of those four principles is involves design and programming. That's something that um, in public space work, there's a great emphasis on those kinds of elements. And the, the three other principles really reflect, um, try to extend the, the understanding so that we are much more deliberately inclusive. So the first principle is about um, the context, the lived experience of people who are in that place, the history, um, and that's something that it can easily be overlooked. The second principle is about the process, which is something that planners um, hopefully think about, or, and if you are, maybe some governments have a mandate to do, but isn't always done um, in a very inclusive way. The third is the design and programming, and the fourth is uh, actually the sustainability of the place the ongoing stewardship possibilities, the ongoing maintenance of that place so that we're not creating spaces that can't carry and support a community into the future. Um, we're really excited that this is a living document so that, and that all of these different principles with their 50 measurable indicators and 158 metrics, it can be overwhelming, but the point is that it's a menu and it has a way of, um, it has a it, ha it provides a structure to go in and then to add different kind of relevant pieces to the process that you might be undertaking. That's great. Thanks, Shimpei. Um, Stephanie, you, you work with communities every day and um, Shimpei mentioned the, the emphasis that the framework has on inclusion. What does inclusion look like on the ground? Stephanie? I think there's several aspects that the framework offers in the notion of inclusion. I think the first piece is really thinking about the characteristics of the people who are present. Like I stated earlier, oftentimes we are de de designing plans and places um, based off of who's coming, not necessarily who lives there, and being able to have a true understanding of the context of those who have lived there, the lived history, the lived experience is critical. And it means actually walking the streets. It means actually engaging in people, uh, engaging with people. I think one of the things that was really powerful um, is being able to really experience and explore Copenhagen and Malmo at the street level and being able to go into different corridors and fully understand the lived experience for those who, who, who experience um, the, the various neighborhoods that we visited. I'd like to also add that, um, particularly as we talk about uh, our learning journey to Copenhagen, folks often say, well, they, they seem to be a very homogenous community. They don't necessarily have the same challenges that we do here in the States. And, you know, I think one of the lessons learned from the trip was really being able to understand that um, there is great diversity there and the challenges, particularly as it 
as it relates more specifically to race and income class um, were things that we really got to see firsthand. And in developing the framework, really being able to talk about those predictors of exclusion um, are one of the measurements that we talk about. And, and again, the community assets and who uses them? What does it, how is it used? Um, one of the photos earlier on, um, included a nightlife scene and the fact that they planned for one of their parks that really thought about who's going to be there at night. Oftentimes when we think about our public spaces, we only think about it as a daytime experience. They also plan for homeless residents in, in, in the creation of their park benches. It was just really powerful to really think about the fact that they really thought about all users in that process and that they had a planning process that really did think about civic trust, participation, and building social capital, which again is part of um, the principles in the framework. And then I would also just add, um, you know, the quality of the public space, who had access, what accessibility meant, the use and the users who use it, and the safety and security that was found in it. Um, and I think all of these things just speak to the intentionality that was used in the designing elements, which I think is really powerful. Thank you. That's great. Um, Shin Pei, before we open it up to uh, to the audience, um, so for people who are interested in using this framework in their community, where do they start? How can they apply this in the real world, and what might they expect in terms of outcomes? Yeah, that's such a great uh, question. Um, we've actually had the privilege of taking this out for a test drive in the real world. Um, we've been working with the New York City Department of Health and to um, and, and use the framework to just design a research outline that would measure the impact of a uh, creative placemaking project that they have been supporting. Um, and what we were measuring with this project, it was basically um, the putting art on, it's called the 100 Gates Initiative. And it's basically putting art on these, um, you know, like retail gates that come down at night, um, which usually are just metal and don't have much going on. And it was looking at what happens if you try to enliven those kinds of places. We were trying to measure the perception of belonging and sense of place. Um, that using the framework, we're able to really assess, you know, where where along the four principles are, are the um, the drivers that we care about. Where, where are the, what are the indicators um, that we want to measure? And then what can we actually f um, foreseeably measure here? And there was a, um, you know, we did some light ethnography, we did observations, and we, we used intercept surveys. So you, you're hearing a whole smattering of different methods that are used in, in the study um, it, to, to help us understand the impact of uh, a creative placemaking project. Um, you know, and the other part of that project was also just seeing how usable the, the metrics are, and that's something that we expect, that we'll, we hope to get a lot of feedback on, um, you know, get, tell, us, tell us how it's going if you take this out for a ride. So unfortunately, I don't have any um, out insights from that specific project. We just wrapped it up, and we're actually in the process of um, an analyzing the data now, but overall, it was a great way of just even working with a city agency to show them that it was possible to take these measurements from projects they're doing and to make that connection between health and public space in the, and, and the social impact. Great, great. So um, we'll be turning to audience questions. So please remember to just uh, enter your questions into the Q&A box that's, uh, that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I wanted to thank you, Stephanie and Shin Pei. Um, I really, I really love hearing about your experiences um, and and how you're thinking about this work. Um, so one of one of the first questions we've gotten in is, um, I guess for for you, Stephanie, which is how do you reconcile conflicting needs and desires among community members when creating an inclusive public space? So I think it's very important to at least um, allow for the voices to be heard. Oftentimes when we are planning for spaces and places, we, we intentionally or unintentionally may be um, targeting specific groups. 
And so one of the questions that we often encourage folks to think about is how are you co-creating and integrating equity in the project's plans or process? Um, how are you engaging the appropriate community voices? Have you actually had conversations with those who may be impacted or influenced by the project um, as just key starting grounds? And I think holding the tension. I think more importantly, people want to be heard, but then they also want to make sure or, or at a minimum know that um, their voices have been acknowledged. So even in the planning process, being able to say, here's what we've heard and acknowledging that their voices actually were considered, and then explain why you may be going one way or another. Um, there is great respect in just being able to honor the voices of those who have created the time to come and speak and share the things that they believe need to happen um, or that they want to see in their neighborhood. That's great. Um, Next question, maybe Shinpei. Um, could you talk a little bit about the kinds of engagement tools you're using with the community? Um, well, with ours, we think of um, ways of uh, helping people see that their spaces can change and that they have a role in changing and making that possible. So we might um, actually train people we might with this framework train people um in the uh creation of you know in the execution of the uh, study so that they can be a part of the data collection they can be a part of the people going out to talk to people to conduct some of the surveys to do an assessment of the physical spaces um and then you know in, in some cases we're talking we're talking about working in communities where there isn't much of anything and in those cases the design practice our sister organization has spent a lot of time um, figuring out you know how do we best get people to tell us what they are excited about for their city um, and we they've done um, a survey called my favorite places where people can jot down ideas of what they like to do as a way of gathering information because if no one's walking around some in it, which is very common in some in the American context, um, then there's no one to really talk to. So it's important to really think about talking to the right people, making sure you're being inclusive in the process, giving them a way to give feedback that isn't uh, kind of um, stuck in the, on the methods to be creative in the methods that you're getting. You're really getting the essence of what they might want in the in, in their communities. Great. Um, we had a couple questions related to policy. Um, what sorts of policy recommendations uh, might you make, and um, what um, you know? How do you truly sort of engage policymakers um, in, in in inclusive public spaces? Um, I'm happy to start with that, with answering that a little bit by uh, maybe grounding us on why public spaces are so important. You know, what we know for sure is that place matters and that your zip code can truly determine your life out outcomes. And so really thinking about how um, the, the, the spaces and places that we engage um, tell the story about what's working and what's not working oftentimes with the system. You can travel anywhere in really America or the world and be able to s learn so much based off of the public spaces. And so one of the things that we often ask ourselves, at least within Spark, is who's benefiting and who's burdened by the policies that may be, um, that we may be putting into place or even the plan that we may be doing. Um, because oftentimes we don't necessarily consider the unintended consequences. We are all doing the best in terms of um, our intentions for why we believe things should happen, but asking that very basic question can allow us to really see, um, you know, if we're creating harm and really thinking about how we do a do no harm policy. And when we do identify a harm, being able to really think about how we mitigate for those challenges in advance. I think these are really simple things that um, really help us to really start thinking more intentionally and inclusively in. In, in the unintended consequences in advance of those things happening, creating those spaces. On specific policies, I think it's 
being able, and it's been really powerful working with local advocates through SPARK, um, their recognition that it's, it takes many. So it's not just advocates, it's not just elected officials, it's not just academics, it's not just the local practitioners of planners. Um, it requires everyone, um, and including the private sector, to really think about how these investments are being made. And it, it is in the collaboration of the table, really coming together and, and working on the execution of the plan that I think really allows for transformative outcomes. And I think that's one of the things that we did get a chance to see in Copenhagen. We saw the government, we saw the local community planter, uh, planners being embedded in communities for the five years of being able to execute on a plan. We saw local advocates being able to hear their voices heard in the process. And so it was just really powerful to see the intentionality of even how policies and the plans and then the implementation, how all of those things were happening in um, coordination with one another with so many different groups coming to the table. That's great. And, and I think sort of a natural follow on question is, uh, comes from someone this is sort of, and Shinpei, you might wanna address this one. Um, can US cities afford the design decisions that European cities like Copenhagen make or is the US public sector just too under-resourced? And I know you have done a lot of work in, in New York and, and other US cities, and, and I wonder if you might speak to that. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's one of those misconceptions maybe that public spaces need a, a lot of high design um, or, um, you know, what they need in terms of resources is stewardship. And, and the stuff that makes a difference can be quite small, so long as they're implemented uh, universally throughout a city. So when you, when you are thinking about inclusive practices, thinking about what actually helps, you know, for example, in the United States, actually, curb cuts are a very small detail, but, have, but are really a symbol of inclusion but they're very rarely ubiquitously applied throughout an entire city. So, you know, the, those kinds of details make a huge difference in public spaces. Um, and it's, it's, the, it's the universal application, I think, that has the biggest potential. We often don't take advantage of the opportunities to collaborate and um, create public spaces that are a combination of maybe, you know, um, the resources from parks and transportation. So you're looking at the edges of a park and how to extend the boundaries, um, or perhaps it's environmental protection and, uh, and parks because you're thinking about um, stormwater management and um, plantings and, uh, you know, the kinds of resources that you put there. So I think that maybe with the metrics that we're talking about here, that's something that European cities are, have a little bit more practice around that has actually enabled that interagency collaboration in a sharing of resources that is something that we could adopt on the US side. I would also add that um, we spend billions of dollars in infrastructure and what we're seeing um, based off of the elections is that people are willing to pay for um, local projects that they see actually benefiting them. And oftentimes when we think about public spaces, um, I think I want to just echo one of the things that Champagne said, which is the stewardship and the leadership that is required and just making sure that it's actually working for them. There are a lot of underutilized parks and spaces and places in part because um, it's not serving the community and really addressing their mo more immediate needs. And I think being able to leverage um, the opportunities when investments are being made and thinking about all of those pieces together allows for a better design. Um, and I would also just add that um, we, we are we are in a space in America in a time where not only are we um, building a lot and you're seeing it in many urban areas, but our infrastructure is aging. And so we do have an opportunity to build in such a way that really thinks about all who, that really thinks about the community and all the people who currently live there and also those who are coming. Um, I would 
I would like to just maybe echo one more piece that Champay said, which is I think the notion of how we think about um, inclusion in a way that we measure what matters. And oftentimes we don't really think about um, that. And, and that we really need to think about what are people using and the assets that they need and then making the investments based off of that. Because I would say that to invest a billion dollars and it's still not necessarily meet our immediate needs or outcomes means that we're probably not spending it correctly. And I think that there's an opportunity to invest in a way that allows for more equitable outcomes, but also for every age and every ability, um, even as we talk about the curb cut effect and what that means. It's one of the best examples um, actually done by um, Angela Glover Blackwell from Policy Link, where she talks about the fact that we all have benefited from the curb cut um, and also the automatic door opener. And it's a policy that was meant for one group, those who were being impacted by the American, through the American Disabilities Act, but yet it's something that we have all benefited from. And so I think that being able to set targeted policies that address inequities, but also plan for who's currently living in the spaces and who's coming allows for a better design and which people will be willing to pay for. That's great, that's great. Um, so we have someone who, who says that they live in a smaller community in a more rural part of the US. And I'm wondering if, if either of you might speak to how, how does the framework apply to more rural communities? How do we think about inclusive, uh, healthy places in more rural parts of the country? Wh whoever wants to respond. Oh, well, this is Shinpei. I can take a first stab at this. Um, you, you know, the framework is new, so it's not that we have specifically applied it in a rural setting. But um, as I said earlier, there's the design and the design and programming is only one principle and what's really important just to emphasize what stephanie has been talking about is that there's a consideration for the lived experiences of people who are already there and maybe there isn't a very obvious um, public space or iconic space in rural areas but usually there are gathering places where people come together and they are public and there, there could be ways of thinking about using um, this framework or thinking about those places and how they can better foster social connections, how they can invite more people to be there, how they can engender trust. And those are some of the things that um, are in this framework that um, make some suggestions towards. There's a really interesting project actually happening, which is not necessarily in a rural area, but in, um, in northern cities, in winter cities, they, they have a similar effect where it's hard for people to get together. And you know, there's a lot of potential. People are very innovative, um, find ways to be together. And um, I've, I know that, for example, in Wisconsin, there are these, um, uh, let's say, community centers that are like um, places where people have dinner and hang out all day long on Saturdays. And they're kind of like, uh, on the side of a road, there's just a building that has food and has places to hang out. And people go to these places just to hang out. And they're out of the cold. They, um, they're not in a town per se, but they're at a kind of a nexus point in a rural setting. So, you know, we have to think more creatively, but I think it's still very possible to be inclusive and to support health um, in, in public spaces in rural settings. I would also add that we were very intentional in creating the framework that it would be a framework. Um, oftentimes folks want a guide, they want case making, and the reality is that you often can't fully duplicate things that other cities have done in a way because of the politics, the time, the resources, but there are some key factors that seem to be game changers, and I think one of the things that the framework offers are those four key um, principles um, that need to be considered as part of it. And also that the framework isn't linear. So you don't have to start um, at the beginning where we might be really thinking about context and process um, and then going to design, program, and sustain because your project may already be 
along the continuum, but that you could start at any point and dig down into what your community needs more specifically and take what works for you. I think that um, what was really great in traveling with so many leaders um, in this field was just the shared experience of where the different perspectives were coming from. And so it wasn't really about urban, rural, race, class, Though all, all of those things were mentioned and all of those things were incorporated and considered, but it was also about how we continue to um, sustain um, even after the investment is made in the thought process of how it benefits. So the ongoing representation, being able to support community stability, being able to think about the ongoing investment in the space and preparing for the change that may happen. I think one of the great things that um, can happen at the rural level and actually even at the broader regional level is the notion of of being able to share resources and services. When I travel, I often say, particularly when I get the rural question, is that there's no place in America that is not being asked to do more with, do more with less resources. We are all having to figure out the best way to manage the various resources that we've been we've received, but what has been more transformative are the way, the times when we've been able to bring other partners along in the journey, leverage those investments, and continue to support and advance transformational change. And I think none of those things are changed in using this framework. I think you can do all of those things that we've listed and being able to really think about how we bring other partners in the area to really um, be intentional. Because there's always one space in a community or, or a place that many people go. And starting there might be the first start to really continuing the journey. Great, thank you. So, you know, as I've gotten to, to become sort of more knowledgeable about the role of public spaces, it seems like it's, it's one of these, uh, true um, sort of multi-solving approaches in that, you know, public spaces can, has, have the potential to solve many of our problems, um, not solve, but at least contribute to solutions to many of our problems, um, whether it's health, whether it's pollution. Um, and so there's a question, I think, along those lines, which is, can you speak more specifically, and this, this is, I guess, to both of you, can you speak more specifically on how sustainability and health are incorporated in the creation of public spaces. Uh, for example, increasing tree coverage to reduce heat island effects, uh, things like that. So it's sort of how, how, does, um, how, how does health and let's say, um, you know, issues related to the environment and climate change, how, do the, how does that come together yeah. as we think about public spaces? Um, yeah, it, well, decision pay, and maybe I'll just speak to a few examples. I think we're starting to see, get the research about these correlations of, you know, tree cover as, tree cover as a public health infrastructure. Um, you might have, some people might have seen that article last week, or even um, I just saw a really interesting article about neighborhood green spaces and how they can be a deterrent against crime and the um, prevent violence in neighborhoods. And, and so these are, these are public health considerations. Um, I, I think that, you know, while we know of these, uh, you know, these um, correlations and um, how they can support, how these two sectors can support each other, I think this framework is actually an attempt to provide some provide ways of gathering more evidence for the for us to show that that is obviously very true um and it, and i think it I, and I think what this question is really getting beyond is you know it, it goes beyond maybe the um kind of obvious uh climate change effects from um extreme extreme um natural events right we're not talking about that we're talking about sort of the everyday kind of infrastructure both green infrastructure and thinking about ways that that can work together. And obviously public space itself, um, just to uh, reiterate um, a point Stephanie was making, is infrastructure in its own way. It's a system of spaces where people make social connections. And, um, and obviously then 
with all these different systems overlaid, there's a way that we can make sure, uh, and this is what the research has been bearing out, that that, the, that system can reach and bring us health outcomes, um, you know, whether it's mental health or physical health um, or, you know, or the social, um, the social um, needs of being a human being, or it's the environmental benefits of having public spaces. I would also um, add the, maybe just starting at the beginning of like, when we think about the word sustain, it means to support, to uphold, to endure, um, to provide what is needed to exist. And I think that there is a great opportunity that building um, inclusive, healthy places offers and just being able to allow for people to sustain. Um, but then when we go to the core principles of sustainability, there are three key pillars and we often talk about it as the social inclusion, the economic prosperity and the environmental stewardship. Um, what I would say is that for a very long time, um, we probably, and I sit at a at, at a large green organization representing NRDC, we've done a we've done a lot in really thinking about the environmental aspect and even the economic. But the intersection between the social inclusion is one where we still have a lot of work and opportunity to to do more on. And um, I think just grounding us in that reality when we think about the people aspect um, in addition to the planet and the profit, um, there is really an opportunity for us to really ask those questions around who, again, going back to that basic question of who's, good, who's benefiting and who's burdened by it. And I think one of the things that the framework offers um, is actually the fourth pillar, which is to sustain of the uh, principles. And it, as part of that, it's really thinking about how do you continue that ongoing representation. But I think throughout the framework, we ask those key questions and being able to offer context around um, the vulnerability. Uh, one of the things that we have been doing at NRDC is really looking at through Spark. Um, uh, doing a, a, a climate vulnerability assessment. And as part of that, it is the intersection of health, of climate, and also equity as part of it. And so being able to understand, like the framework asks, what is the current context that the community is doing and enduring and having to deal with in the investments that are already being made? What is the current process that offers greater sustainability or that can promote greater trust and participation in social capital? And then how do we design a system or a project that really thinks about and incorporates the impacts of climate change? Um, I think things like sea level rise, the temperature, the, the precipitation that we're feeling, the storms, even the wildfires that we are seeing offers a great space for us to really think about, again, some of these very basic things. What is the context? In what neighborhood? What does that mean? And being able, again, to ask that question of who will benefit and who will be burdened by this investment and in even holding that climate change factors um, that people do need to be able to sustain and endure long after the investments and also long after Mother Nature has taken hold of some of the issues that may impact a community. That's great. Th thanks to both of you. Um, so uh, I, we, we have time for one more question and, and I'm really sorry we couldn't get to all of all of the questions that were asked, but uh, we'll, we'll send an email out after the webinar on how to continue this conversation. Um, so the last question feels kind of fitting as, as a closing question. Uh, someone, uh, someone says that um, their town has an old fashioned public health department it doesn't think much about public spaces or concerns of the built environment. Um, what ideas do you have to bring them around? And, um, and I guess that's to both of you, but I, I'll just start by maybe saying that this is an area that the foundation has um, invested quite a lot uh, of, of time and, and, and resources um, into this question is the role of place and health. And of, of course, Stephanie, you mentioned the, um, just the data we have about the role of place in life expectancy, for example. So, um, Stephanie, maybe do you want to start and then Shinpei can add in? Yes, I would say uh, one, uh, don't give up on them. Uh, invite them into the spaces where people are and have the conversations. And, um, you know, I think 
have encourage encourage um, them through your support. I think oftentimes people get very flustered when we start to talk about things outside of their um, practition, their, their areas of expertise. We hold on to wanting to feel like we are the experts of a specific way of doing things. Um, but I think to the extent that you're able to bring others along in inviting them into the conversations and letting them know that they don't have to have all the solutions and that this is an opportunity like this framework where we are actively testing and innovating in real time um, to use what works for your community is a great start. And I would also just um, maybe also think about incorporating and finding ways to give them the support that they need by partnering with academic institutions where you could have students who have have maybe newer knowledge and opportunities to help support their work so that they don't feel like they're by themselves in the process and that you're supporting them with some of the resources that could be available and bringing fresh new ideas. It's something that we um, I've done at various different levels and it, it does seem to work because I do think that um, ultimately people want to do better but um, with limited resources or, or the perception of limited resources and time um, they feel like they can only stick to what they know and I think being able to help them along the learning journey allows for all of us to thrive in the process. Yeah I, I second a lot of what Stephanie said and just um, want to just offer a couple of a, um, build on a, on that and offer a couple of suggestions. One is, you know, often people who are maybe in a more conservative culturally cultural setting and in terms of conservative in the sense of being opposed to change. Um, they often feel maybe that new ideas are an additional burden or that they're not appreciated for what they're already trying to do. And so I think it's important to show how your ideas fit into what they're trying to achieve. And you generally public servants really care about what they're about, you know, what about their role and about their job and what they are bringing to a community, even if you happen to disagree with them. So, um, you know, trying to find a way to make what you want a part of, you know, what a part of what they do rather than an additional thing that they have to figure out on their own um, is one way of doing it and then figuring out experiences so you can really maybe get them outside of their um, comfort zone and put them in new settings. I, I had a boss who was in charge of trying to bring people together a lot and he had to take, he had to figure out a way to get the, you know, the engineer out of their um, old ways of thinking. And so he convened a meeting because uh, it was a regional organization he and they have purview over the zoo he actually made everyone meet at the zoo and and they talked about what they needed to talk about but in the setting where they were surrounded by animals and and, and it was about something really new and different so people re really just um, were in a really different setting and that's that's actually what our learning journey was all about was to really challenge what we um, you know challenge the assumptions we don't even know that we have and to be able to see that things can be different. Wonderful, I love that. To challenge the assumptions we don't even know that we have. I think that that's, that's great. So this has been a really great discussion and, and of course I wish we had more time. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie and Shinpei. Um, I wanted to close by just sharing one final example from our trip to Copenhagen. Um, that really uh, made me think about inclusion in, in perhaps a, a, a deeper way. And it has to do with trash cans. So um, just like in many cities, um, people in Copenhagen can return used bottles and cans for cash. Um, but in Copenhagen, the trash cans are equipped with uh, small sort of deposit shelves. You can see in this picture of the trash can on the, on the right, um, where they can place recyclables. So this makes it easier, safer, and more sanitary for people to collect discarded bottles and cans. There's no digging through smelly garbage or sharp glass. Um, the the uh, photo on the left is a, uh, is a trash can that is geared towards cyclists, because of course, lots of cyclists in, in Copenhagen. So it's a, the trash cans are a great example of how the smallest details in our public places can respect our values as a society values of inclusion, respect, and dignity for all. 
So as soon as we're done, a very short survey will pop up on your screen. We hope you'll take a moment to fill it out and let us know what you thought of today's webinar. And we hope you'll join us for the next Reimagined in America webinar. Um, and just a reminder, we'll be sending out an email with the recording, which we hope you will share far and wide. And with that, I'd like to say thanks again to Shin Pei and Stephanie and to everyone who joined us here today. Please fill out the survey and have a great rest of your day.